Um, so it's great to have an opportunity to formally welcome you all here to the 63rd annual meeting of the Society for French Historical Studies. I'm Lisa, Lisa Leff, one of the co-presidents, and we are so happy to have you here at the meeting and at, and at this plenary lunch. I want to take a minute of your time to publicly recognize the people who put this event together, the executive committee that gave us so much support, the program committee who did so much work in putting the program together, our student workers from GW and Georgetown, and especially my co-president, Katrin Schulteis, who did so, so much. So um, when Linda Clark convinced me to host FHS in Washington, it was <laughs> years ago in LA, actually at the LA conference, and um, times felt very different. And already, already back then, was that 2013 maybe? 2012. 2012. Already then, um, I already thought about having our plenary session be on this topic. But when I look back at my notes, I realized the concerns that I had back then were quite different. Um, and, and by the time I got to kind of working with Jonathan on putting it together, there had appeared, I want to kind of, I think this is an interesting prehistory to share with you. When Jonathan and I first talked about it, it was because of this article that um, Thomas Bender had published in the Chronicle Review in 2015 um, entitled, Historians Have Lost Their Public. Uh, I don't know if anyone else saw this, but it was quite interesting. He argued that as opposed to scholars in a previous era, earlier in the 20th century, um, we scholars today no longer write books in compelling but readable prose that shapes public discourse for our generation. Um, and he says that the results of this are bad for us and bad for the world, right? What it means is that we leave all public commentary to the journalists and the pundits. And instead of, like it used to be in this previous era, having a close connection between scholars and journalism, we've separated these fields. And as a result, journalism is impoverished. And so are we. Um, so the point of the article was obviously to ask us to turn back, right, to what our um, uh, to what those who came before had once done. Um, you know, that we should explain current events, that we should make our work more readable and more relevant. And when I look back at that article, I think so, so much has changed, right? Thomas Bender doesn't need to convince us anymore because the world seems like it's turned upside down. Uh, current events seem to confound everyone there's a sense of crisis, not just in our democracy, but in so many of the world's democracies. And also less and less faith in the credibility of the press coming from all quarters. And then for some of us, and I'm sure many of us, many of you in this room, <clears throat> see patterns, right, from our work, things that we know about from the past that might help actually explain what's going on. Um, and we see a, something that we have to say to this public conversation, and yet very few of us are trained to do that. So um, this conversation to me seems more timely than when it was conceived, and we're quite fortunate to have with us two French historians who are actually quite experienced in bringing their work to bear on current events and other questions in the public sphere. And um, as you read in the program, they're not going to be delivering papers, so in keeping with the subject, they're going to be sharing their ideas in a conversation. Let me introduce them. This conversation will be led by Jonathan Judakin, who is Spence Professor of Humanities at Rhodes College in Memphis. Jonathan is perhaps best known in this crowd for his scholarship on anti-Semitism and racism. He's the author of Jean-Paul Sartre and the Jewish Question, Anti-Antisemitism and the Politics of the French Intellectual. And he's editor of three other books. But Jonathan is also very much a public intellectual. He's the host of Counterpoint, which is a radio show um, at the NPR affiliate WKNO in Memphis. <clears throat> 
Now, Jonathan's going to be leading a conversation today with Robert Zaretsky, who's professor of history at, uh, in the Honors College and Department of Modern and Classical Languages at the University of Houston, and I should say, a former host of this conference. Um, Rob is the author of seven books that range widely in topic, from his first book on the history of Neem during World War II, to books I'm sure you know on Albert Camus, to his most recent book, Boswell's Enlightenment, which came out in 2015 from Harvard. But also, much of Rob's writing has been directed at a wider audience. He publishes regularly in mainstream newspapers and magazines, such as the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Houston Chronicle, Foreign Policy, the Los Angeles Review of Books. And it's this type of work that he's here to talk about today. So we're incredibly fortunate that these two scholars and public intellectuals are here with us. Please join me in welcoming them as I turn things over to John. Thank you, Lisa. So I just want to begin by uh, also thanking the executive committee and Katrin Schultweiss and Robert Isaacson, and, and especially Lisa, Lisa Leff, um, who asked me um, a while ago if I would be willing to um, participate in this. And, um, and then, uh, as we were discussing various people that perhaps I could engage in a conversation with or interview with, she was the one who suggested Robert Zaretsky. And I was so excited when she did so. Um, not only because I have been reading Rob's work since Neem at War, but also because he has come across my radar often in the form of the journalistic interventions, the op-ed uh, pieces that he's written, and I really find him to be a model in terms of this kind of work. And I was already thinking that Rob was someone that I had wanted to interview, and so I'm very excited that we're going to have this conversation today. Um, I want this conversation to have a particular arc. Uh, I want us to begin by talking about the general crisis in the humanities today. And I want to segue from there to a discussion about how French studies, or French history, um, fits within that larger crisis. Um, uh, all focused around the role that professors can play within the public sphere. And then I want us to, and I want us to range from kind of a big picture conversation about the moral imperative to engage in the public sphere down to nuts and bolts about how and where one can do precisely that, uh, Rob. So, Let's, let's begin with a quote from an article that you wrote in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, the article was called The Lessons of Brexit for the Humanities. To get at how you understand the crisis at the present. This is what you wrote. The great ideas that once inspired our colleges are being replaced by bureaucratic technicians and marketing gurus. Of course, Humanities professors have abetted the narrowing of these ideals and ideas. The flourishing of subfields and specializations, the contagion of academic jargon, the resistance to interdisciplinary studies, and indifference to engaging the public. I really want to highlight that phrase in particular, indifference to engaging the public. These trends have contributed to the decay of the humanities. So is the recent flurry of demands for safe spaces and efforts to disinvite speakers whose ideas differ from those of student activists. But the greatest driver to these changes is the corporatization of our campuses. So starting with that quote, can you unpack some of that? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> is the mic working? Okay. Lisa promised me that I would sound like Liam Neeson. <laughs> Do I? Yes. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, before I try to answer that question, 
I'd like to thank Lisa for having thought of me um, um, for this session, um, as well as the other organizers, Catherine, the students back uh, in the back of the room, um, and Jonathan for working with me. In fact, Jonathan has written the script, um, and so I'm simply going to be parroting what Jonathan wants me to say to each and every one of these questions. Um, this is going to go great. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the case, the bag that uh, Jonathan has invited me to unpack has a number of items. Um, I suspect that most of these items are familiar to most everyone in this room. Um, some of the items you might um, uh, think are accurate, others are less than accurate. And we can talk about those. The one item that I would like to bring up briefly, because I do want this to be a conversation, not just between the two of us, Jonathan and myself, but amongst everybody here in the room eventually. Um, the item that I find uh, most disturbing, both from personal experience as well as from what I've gleaned from a modicum of research, is the corporatization of the university. Um, um, when England voted last summer to separate itself from the European Union. Um, the first thought that came to my mind was, why don't we do that in the humanities? <laughs> um, and I called it Hexit <laughs> in the article. Um, and I thought this because the very same trends um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we see in the humanities um, or at universities in the United States resemble those trends that we see in the European Union. Uh, for example, the democratic deficit, uh, the disconnect between those who are located in Brussels and Strasbourg and are issuing all of the directives for the 28 member states. And this has a parallel today with our universities. You have administrations um, that are increasingly disconnected from the lives of not just their students, but their faculty. And yet, they also issue directives that, in my case at the University of Houston, I'm compelled to now place in my syllabi, even though I was never consulted on these directives. Um, and many of these administrators have never been in a classroom, just as the semi-mythical um, administrator or functionnaire in Brussels has never um, farmed tobacco or artichokes, but yet here she is or he is doing more or less the same thing. And so I thought, perhaps the humanities really ought to declare their independence from their Brussels, namely their administrations, and launch out on their own. Um, but of course, um, that's simply not possible. This is what I brought up towards the end of the piece, um, that we are more or less condemned to this situation. Um, and I thought, well, um, this was a very satisfying moment for Great Britain, or at least for 51% of British voters um, um, when they voted for Brexit. Um, and I thought, well, this would be a satisfying moment for humanists, for those in the liberal arts as well. But I then realized that, as I think will be the case with, um, with Great Britain, that life within the structure of the EU um, as flawed as it is, um, is far better than life outside the structure. And so it was really a starting point. What do we do as just one item, one country within this EU-like world that we now find ourselves in, at corporate universities? And so in part it was an effort to establish a parallel between what's taking place with the EU and what's taking place at our universities, um, but also the recognition that um, 
we are condemned, just as, for example, Spain is condemned to live with um, France. Um, or that, <laughs> I don't know why that came to mind. <laughs> Um, but so too is at my university, the hotel of restaurant, um, the, the school of hotel and restaurant management is condemned to live with the Department of Modern and Classical Languages. And that we do have to find a common language. Um, and that there are ways in which this can be done. Um, it's done, for example, and my dear friend and colleague Sarah Fishman is nodding her head, but we do find ways of doing that at the University of Houston, especially through the Honors College, where I teach. But that was just a starting point. And of course, all the other things in that bag that Jonathan would like for me to unpack, I'll, I'll leave there for now, unless there's something else that you think requires immediate unpacking and, and a defense. So let me say also a few a little bit more about the corporatization of the university not, um, and the, the impact of its structures in terms of the larger discourse within the country, I think, um, that underpins this. Because, because I actually think that the death knell for higher education in America has actually been sounded. I am worried that by the time I retire, let's say in two generations, <laughs> in about 40 years, higher education as I knew it when I stepped into the game will no longer exist. I honestly believe that we are facing that level of crisis and it's because there is a discourse out there that basically says public education is a private good. It's not a public good. That's what underpins it. Just two examples of the depth of the crisis. Um, I've read statistics, and I really would like to know the hard numbers on this, that of all courses that are being taught in higher education, something like 50%, as much as 75%, I've read other places, are being taught by adjunct faculty. That's one uh, symptom of the crisis. The other thing is that public, public uh, institutions are no longer being funded by public dollars. When I first began uh, teaching at University of Memphis, over 50% of the budget came from the state. By the time I left there 12 years later, they were down to 30% with a stated goal that it would be 25%. The best institutions of higher education in the United States are being funded at less than 10%, places like University of Virginia, University of Michigan. Um, in some cases, in fact, what the state contributes is nothing more but than in-kind exchanges. The, it's a fiction, actually, that they're funding higher education at all. Um, so I think there's a very, very deep crisis. Um, and one aspect of the crisis that we have some control over has to do with bridging the chasm that currently exists between the so-called ivory tower, ostensibly peopled by pointy-headed liberal elites uh, who are completely separate from the concerns of ordinary Americans, um, divorced from the reality of the key issues that we face um, in our public. Now, we only have so much control over the broader structural economic forces that are changing higher education in America, but we do have some control over how it is that we relate to uh, the broader public. And so today, I'm really hoping that w I know we are going to articulate a strong case for us as professors uh, in the public <coughs> sphere becoming engaged. And I know, Rob, when you and I have exchanged about this, um, I, I think when I 
say there's a death knell that has been announced in, in existentialist parlance sometimes we gain a certain insight about uh, a clarity about uh, what it is that we should spend our lives doing uh, when we face death I think when you and I have exchanged uh, on this, your, your tone is also existential. You don the kind of position of, of a Camusian moraliste. Uh, um, and uh, you've talked about the professors voicing their views in the public sphere as a moral imperative. Why a moral imperative? It sounds good. <laughs> um, well, you know, to make, to cite, for example, Camus and this notion of an existential crisis, um, I, I don't believe it's an existential crisis. Um, I do think it's uh, a crisis of our profession. Um, and it's a crisis that has a ripple effect um, and that we can play a role. Um, I'm not as pessimistic as I suspect you are, Jonathan. Um, uh, you make mention of Camus. One of my favorite sayings by Camus is that um, there's no reason for hope, but that's no reason to despair. Um, and that's a situation in which I found myself, and I don't describe myself as a public intellectual. I describe myself as a charlatan. Um, I, I find myself writing about things nowadays that I'm really not qualified to write about. And, that's, and, that's, and that really is... Um, um, an issue that I think many intellectuals have had to face over the generations, what we can call mission creep, that you begin when you start to write for a wider audience, you begin to write about things that you do know something about. Um, for example, Nîmes during the Second World War, um, or about um, <coughs> the Jewish community in modern France but then you begin receiving requests, appeals for articles that range ever wider. And it is so very attractive. Uh, it's so compelling. And, you know, at times I, I should do what Odysseus does and put beeswax in my ear and have myself strapped to the kitchen table by my wife. <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> Um, but instead, I say, sure, when do you need it by? In 24 hours, you've got it. Um, um, but we do have a role as historians, and we do have a moral imperative. Um, and by moral imperative, by morality, I mean something in the normative sense, that there is a set of principles which we all recognize and that we need to act upon in order to distinguish what's good and what's bad. And a corollary of that is what's right and what's wrong, what's truthful and what's false. That's our professional task, and it's a professional task that bleeds into a moral task. Specifically, it's about our relationship to the past. We were taught, as graduate students, to get it right, right? By doing all that we can in the archives, unearthing as much material as possible, sifting through it, weighing it, balancing it once at one against the other, interviewing when we can, and then create a past or recreate a past that those who lived it would recognize. They would feel chez soi. They would say, yes, this is what I experienced. And by the same token, those who read our accounts, our contemporaries, would also recognize it. They would say, I, I see what's involved. I understand the complexity of this patch of the past. Um, and this we owe not just to the past. Um, we're the curators of the past. But we also owe it to to our world today. I know it sounds presumptuous, um, but when I write a piece, this chasm that Jonathan was talking about, I have one person in mind when I write my journalism. Um, it's my father. <laughs> 
my father, it, it, to be more specific, it's finding ways to keep my father awake. <laughs> because my dad, God bless him, my first two books were monographs. He hasn't gotten past page two. <laughs> it nods off. He's read my other books, though, <laughs> which were which are not monographs, and he reads my journalism, and he's making connections. So as long as Max Zaretsky in Boca Raton is happy, <laughs> I'm happy. I know that I'm connecting with somebody other than somebody in this room. Um, and so that's how I see my job, and I don't see it really as a public intellectual. I just see it as really, David Hume, one of my heroes, um, he faced a similar issue when he, when he published his first work, Treatise of Human Nature. As he famously wrote, it fell stillborn from the press. Nobody read it, nobody reviewed it. And what did David Hume do? Rather than sort of, you know, shuffling off into a corner and pouting, he said, I need to think of a different strategy. And his strategy? Essays. Moral essays, political essays, historical essays. And he didn't stop there. He then went on to write a six-volume history of Great Britain. And in those essays and in that six-volume history of Great Britain, you have his philosophy. Okay? And he always presented himself, and this is his phrase, um, as an ambassador to uh, the world of conversation. Um, nothing is highfalutin as an intellectual, right? But somebody who basically is, is just bringing ideas from one place and just introducing them to another place. Um, I think that's what we should aim for. I, do you? Oh, I'm, I'm all about the fact that Max Zaretsky should stay woke. <laughs> all the Max Zaretskys of the world, my dad and my mom too, like um, keeping, you know, keeping people woke. Um, I want to riff a little bit, though, on, on this notion of the public intellectual. Sure. Because um, we know about the history of that category. And I think, actually, it's precisely the wrong category for us to be thinking about when we think about what I prefer to couch in the language of professors in the public sphere. Let me say a little bit more of why. Uh, the history of that term uh, comes from the morphing of other categories, the struggle between uh, les clercs and clerics in the 17th century, philosophes in the 18th century, the romantic hero, writer like Hugo in the early 19th century, the history of uh, the savant in the middle of the 19th century, all of course coalescing in uh, 1898 in the context of the Dreyfus Affair in the immediate aftermath of Zola's uh, uh, the most famous uh, journalistic piece in the history of all journalism probably uh, Jacques in which there are a group of writers and largely professors who sign the Manifeste des Intellectuels and that is the first time that term itself enters into public discourse especially in the uh, Barres and other uh, anti-Dreyfusard response to that. Um, however, uh, in, to use the title of Vinnie Dada's book, I can't think of myself as a national icon. I'm not Zola or Sartre or Camus or Edward Said or Cornel West. If that's the mantle that we have to uh, don in order to intervene publicly, in order to begin to um, speak to a broader public, that's too daunting. And I think if we think about it instead as professors in the public sphere, that, that's more humble. And I think actually it opens up multiple ways in which we can think about broadening out uh, a set of approaches that we already take in our teaching and in our research and just bring them to publics that go beyond uh, 
our, the four walls of our classroom. And, and if we think about it in those terms, that's a much healthier way to think about it. But there are risks, uh, Rob. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about those, those risks, um, but also about the rewards. So I know one of the things that animates you, uh, I, I read an article in the Chronicle of uh, uh, I read an article in Inside Higher Ed, and it was giving advice to younger scholars in particular who are thinking about using social media as a means to intervene in the public sphere. And one of the points that the article made was that the average academic article is read by 10 people. <laughs> Whereas Di Diane Ravitch's uh, blog has 27 million hits. 10 people, 27 million hits. Um, there's, there's a lot more Mac, Max uh, uh, Zaretsky's in the 27 million number, right? But I know also one of the things that you worry about is that academics are often dismissive of non-scholarly work. Uh, they dismiss it primarily in terms of it being uncomplicated or lacking nuance. Um, and I know also that you were even though you're drawing on, I mean, you have the Socratic wisdom, um, but you're drawing on a deep well of work on the Enlightenment, on uh, the 19th century, on the history of existentialism, on the Vichy period. Um, and at the same time, you, I, I, how do you, have, how have people responded to your journalistic work? I mean, other academics. Um, is this something that you worry about in terms of the marginalization of your primary role as an academic? And of course, most of us aren't going to end up getting tenure because 27 million people read our work. I mean, that's just not the way tenure, so w what do you say about that as one risk? The table in the far right corner, you're all graduate students, right? No. <laughs> oh, just two of you. Um, if I were to invite you to write, say, a monthly essay for the LA Review of Books, would you take that opportunity? Yes. <laughs> and how would that work with your dissertation research? How would that work with your hunt for a job? Do you think that having this perch in LARB would benefit you professionally? It would put a cool hundred dollars in your pocket a month. <laughs> but what about your professional futures? Hundred bucks sounds good to the grad students. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, the reason I ask the question is that, as the history editor at the LA Review of Books, I have approached several tenure line professors to write reviews for for the journal. I have been I, about ninety percent of the time I've been turned down. Why? Not because they're dismissive. They wish they could. They can't. Because they are under such intense pressure to get that book out. To get articles out in peer-reviewed journals. They simply don't have the time. And for many of them, and perhaps I'm wrong, you don't really have the words, because you, you're, you're in this boiler room, right, of graduate work, and you have a language that is understood by everybody else who is a captive in that boiler room, <laughs> right? But as soon as you step outside, you realize, well, wait a second. Um, they're not speaking the same language. I had to find a different language. And so it requires a great deal of effort to write for a wider audience with very little payback. 
I can, from my experience, I get very little credit for my work as a journalist. It's not weighed. In my department, MCL, they simply do not have a category for it. And that's not the reason I do it. I do it because I think that as a historian, I have an obligation to do it. Um, I also enjoy doing it. Um, but so certain, a number of fellow historians are not dismissive. Um, and I've also approached historians who have tenure to write for the LA Review of Books um, who tell me <laughs> that they don't think they can do it, right? That um, they simply don't think that they can find the words, language with which to do it. They say what you're doing is terrific, but it's not me. All by way of suggesting, perhaps, that, um, that if graduate programs in history are going to survive, perhaps even flourish, we have to address this problem. Um, that graduate programs have to find a place um, in which there isn't only attention paid to what one does in archives or what one does with footnotes but what one does with a language that's accessible to those outside the profession. If we don't, we're going to continue to wither and, well, ellipsis. You're sounding death knells. No, 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 um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm sounding hopeless, but um, not despairing. I, I, I mean, I do, I do think that and I've thought for a long time that actually one useful way to read some of Kafka's allegories is about education. Think of a report to the academy. Mm. But I think graduate school in particular, it's Kafka's metamorphosis. <laughs> because this is what happens to you in the boiler room that you were talking about. You wake up one day and you're a bug. <laughs> You no longer know how to connect to the members of your family. This is your struggle. Uh, you don't have a language to be able to speak to them any longer. And I do think that actually, in a very, very deep sense, we could think a lot about the problems of higher education and of graduate education in particular, not only with respect to the way in which it stultifies how we articulate our positions, but even our identities more generally, but I'm not going to go there. Um, I want to um, talk to you a little bit about what you actually do do in the journalistic pieces, um, specifically with respect to this notion, saying something more than just what's going on in the French elections is complicated or, you know, uh, it's really complicated. Um, because I oftentimes feel like that's the template response of academics to just about everything, actually. Um, and, and the way that I see what you're doing in your work is kind of twofold. You, you, do, you, you draw on your background as a social and cultural historian in the work that you write on uh, Jewish uh, uh, pieces and also on contemporary French politics by teaching people who are the key players? What are the main issues? How are the dynamics changing? What's, what is driving those changes? Um, this is a little bit like some of the work that David Bell does, which is also wonderful in this regard. And then in your work that draws more on your intellectual history, um, you're often drawing lessons from great texts or great thinkers to offer insights into the contemporary context. Um, I don't know if you would agree with these being kind of your two main strategies to say something more than just it's really complicated. Um, but what, what, do you, what are you trying to accomplish in your journalistic pieces? I'm trying to connect. Um, and I, I, I think that People like David Bell, who I admire immensely, I've been reading his pieces in the New Republic for years, and in part they're the inspiration for what I've been doing over the last seven, eight years. Um, or people like Jill Lepore in the New Yorker. Um, it's extraordinary what they accomplish. 
Um, and what they accomplish is that they do remind us that it's complicated. But they're able to show us in clear language why it's complicated. So for them, it's a starting point, and it's not the end point. And they, um, I wish I could write as well as they do, and I wish I knew as much about the past as they know. Um, but I think our task as historians is to say, yes, it's complicated, but that, it, that does not mean that it cannot be understood. Um, and you find that you're <laughs> under certain constraints. It depends who you're writing for, what your editor wants from you, who your audience is. And this changes dramatically depending on the venue. Um, it is one thing, for example, in the LA Review of Books where I'm free to write um, as long as I want and on what I want because I'm the editor. Um, and it's in it, electronic format. And it's electronic format, whereas, for example, um, when I write in the Daily Forward, I am limited to 750 words. Um, when I write in the New York Times, it is 800 words. The audience for the Daily Forward is, is there's an overlap, but it's not the same as my editor at the Daily Forward, Dan Friedman, keeps on telling me, Rob, there must be a Jewish angle. <laughs> and I'll reply, Dan, there isn't. And then he'll say, make one up. <laughs> okay. um, and, um, and so I'm writing for an audience that um, has a history with the forward. Um, and I have to keep that in mind. Times is very different. The LA Times is different. For example, the only things that I can write for the LA Times are pieces on film. Um, for example, be it on con or be it on Hollywood or be it on actors. My editor there, Juliet Lapidus, loves those pieces. Um, but that's all she wants from me. Um, and so you have, to, you have to find all sorts of ways to connect. Um, and I'm more than happy that people are willing to give me the chance to do this. It's extraordinary. You know, we all are so lucky, apart from the graduate students, of course. <laughs> we are paid to read. We're paid to write. And we're paid to teach bright kids. It's extraordinary, our lives. I have something even more extraordinary. I'm being paid to write for my dad. <laughs> you know? And I, I find different ways in which I can reach my dad. Um, and it's a challenge. In times I fall flat. Um, at times I realize I shouldn't have taken it up uh, because I'm truly a charlatan in certain cases. But um, I'm still learning the ropes. So you've, you've learned a lot of the ropes, though. Like, you know the lay of the land. You have relationships with these editors that you've built over a long period of time. For people who are uh, vested in the idea of beginning to do some of this kind of work, how do you make a pitch? How do you go from having an idea that you would like to communicate to uh, finding the right uh, venue in order to do it? Uh, Let's start getting into some nuts and bolts. Um, you have to know the journal or the newspaper or the site that you're pitching. Um, you have to read it. You need to read it carefully. There are going to be several rubrics at each of those sites, um, um, each of which you can make a pitch for. And each of those rubrics will have, to give you one example, on my right for foreign affairs. And Foreign Affairs has a series of rubrics. One is called Snapshot. And these are really, I prefer these pieces because they're short, they're punchy. They want a thousand words on an event that's unfolding right now that can be explained or contextualized by the past. And that's terrific, OK? But there's a style at Foreign Affairs, too, that you have to adopt. Um, it's kind of. Um, it's Brookings Institute, or the Council for European Studies. You know, you have to wear the striped shirts and the, and the ties, and um, you have to write as if you're wearing this clothing. 
Whereas at foreign policy, where I write much more often, it's much punchier. They don't wear ties at foreign policy. Okay? And the editors will often pitch me there at this point. And um, they want something that is going to be unlike foreign affairs. They want clickbait. Um, and at times you're forced to play along with them. It's a terrible thing, but you have to make compromises. Um, they're not interested in clickbait at the New York Times because it's the New York Times, right? And they're guaranteed readership. So it varies from journal to journal. So, some journals will not, they don't want a pitch. They want an actual text. Um, but the pitch, if it is a pitch, um, you need to know the journal. Um, and you need to say in the very first line why it's important and you need to grab the reader's attention. And the person who's going to be reading the pitch will not be one of the editors. It will be the equivalent of the grad students in the back of the room, interns. Okay? And they are going through hundreds of pitches every week. So you really have to let them know in, the very, in that very opening sentence why what you have to say about this aspect of French history means something not to French historians, not something to the French, why it means something to their readership, why their readers will want to read it. Okay? And so I think that is the most important thing in mind, the most important thing to keep in mind about a pitch. And the pitches have to be extremely short. You have to say what you need to say in four or five lines. Now, when you do make pitches, when you sort of are coming up with an idea for something that you want to do, are you generally thinking about a one-off? Or are you thinking about kind of a series of things that you want to write about? Or uh, how does it work from kind of idea to inception um, in your case? I imagine the ideas aren't the problem. No, I always have ideas. The problem is finding somebody who thinks the idea is worthy of. Is your hand raised? It is. Oh, um, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a question. I'm just wondering, I'm a graduate student, and I'm wondering when we're going to teach graduate students to write this way. And these, it's very informative what you're saying in terms of how to the process, but I'm wondering when that's going to be part of the formal training so that we know how to write in these multi Modes, um, and your name is? <laughs> yes, my name is Nathan Dutz. Jason? Nathan. Nathan, Dutz. Nathan. And where are you a graduate student? I'm a graduate student at Vanderbilt University. Ah, great. Um, that's, that's, that's terrific. Um, um, no, it really is. Um, you know, it's a terrific question. Um, let me answer very quickly from, based on personal experience. Two years ago, as Sarah knows, I tried introducing a class in writing for the public at the University of Houston. My chair in MCL, Modern Classical Languages, was not interested. The chair in history was not interested. The only individuals at U of H who were interested, the director of the, creating writing, the creative writing program, thought this was a great idea and the dean of the Honors College, which, is, which thrives on interdisciplinary work, teaching, research, and what. But I could not get a response from the traditional departments. I wish I had an answer for you. I don't. Um, um, but I do think, and I don't want to call it existential, but I do think it's an urgent question, um, one that needs to be discussed yesterday. right? Um, and this is something for you to bring up at, uh, you have a remarkable philosopher at Vanderbilt, Todd May, um, who succeeds in doing this when it comes to philosophy. Uh, he's written a beautiful book, by the way, called uh, A Significant Life that came out a few years ago. Um, he's somebody that you might want to talk to. If nobody in French and Italian are doing this, go over to Todd May in philosophy. Tell him, tell him I sent you. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to say that um, 
I want to broaden this out. First of all, also to say that, you know, one medium that neither of us has a real deep imprint is in social media. Um, Facebook is kind of one corner of where some of these conversations are being curated. Twitter even more. Michael Eric Dyson has that wonderful piece on the, on the um, black uh, Twitter intelligentsia as kind of the newest generation of um, black intellectuals in America. And I hope in the course of the Q&A, we'll talk maybe more about social media, about the risks of social media, about what can be accomplished uh, through that venue. But I also just want to put out there a couple of other ways beyond writing trade press books or journalistic type pieces or op-ed pieces, a couple of other models for thinking about professors in the public sphere. And I want to talk a little bit more about a lot of the work I spend a lot of my time doing, public humanities programming. I know that probably to a person, all of you invite people to come to campus to give talks all the time. But my sense is that most of the time, people don't think about these as public humanities programs. You tend to invite people who are your friends or you tend to want, I mean, this is what I've seen a lot, um, people who you think are going to be interesting for your students and that you want to expose them to a co-curricular opportunity that links up with things that you're doing perhaps um, in your syllabi. And one of the things that I've seen is also building out a sense of ownership about these events across the academy and then between the academy and the broader community is not necessarily part of what's going into the architecture of how these events are being built. Um, and I've been doing this kind of public humanities programming for 10 years. Over the course of that time, I've kind of developed four rules for thinking about these events that moves beyond something small and for a very specific audience to something much bigger, a broad cross-university conversation, a conversation between the university and the broader public. Um, so first of all, at inception, one of the things that I like to think about is building a team around an event. Is there more than one person in more than one department who is invested in the topic that you want to have addressed? Can you build a team of people from different places around the university? And partly this is animated by the fact that I spend a lot of my life going around with my hat out, needing to get pools of funds. Um, and that's part of the way in which that works. But you get more people uh, invested financially, but also otherwise. Um, the second thing is that for me, the event itself, the lecture, should be a culminating experience. It should never be a one-off in which you're hopefully hearing someone's voice for the first time and they're inspiring and then everyone goes scatters. It, it should be a culminating experience. And part of the way in which we institutionalize that culminating experience is by making sure that there um, are people teaching this material in many different places across the university. Um, so students are already engaged with it. The third thing is um, to uh, try and have a community sponsor. Someone from the broader public who's also invested in that conversation, who's also going to draw on their networks to help build the um, audience for the events and the people who are interacting with the ideas around the event. And the fourth is to think about these, especially if you're doing them on a regular basis, as part of an enduring set of conversations. What is the afterlife of the event? One of the things that we do is build that afterlife into the events. Um, partly by, uh, rec by video recording each of the events, by having a YouTube presence, by the fact that CounterPoint, uh, the radio show, is partly connected to the series that I do, um, so that it's used both as a vehicle to draw people to the event, but also uh, it has an afterlife in the form of 
you know, iTunes and uh, people being able to stream, um, stream that conversation and reach people who aren't able to be there in the physical space of, of hearing it. So I think these four rules are useful guide posts for people thinking about how whatever the um, speaking engagements are that you're having people do when they come to campus, how can you build something larger um, out of that? And I, 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 I think in general, if we're thinking about um, professors in the public sphere, we've got to be thinking about precisely what it is that we're doing all the time with this larger, audi larger audiences, being in search of the public. Mm -hmm. That's the way Rob speaks about his work. He is in search of publics. Um, I think that's a useful uh, thing to do, to, to think about. I want to talk about one other thing with you, and then maybe we'll open it up to Q and yeah, A for the uh, last fifteen minutes. Um, so, on the front page of the FHS website is is a statement from the AHA condemning Trump's executive order restricting entry into the United States um, from Muslim countries. Another aspect to think about in terms of professors in the public sphere has to do with the question of activism through our academic organizations. What's your take on this, Rob? Um, was this part of the script? It was. I'm, really? not surprising oh, it. I'm not surprising you here. <laughs> um, well, we do have a role. Um, um, I don't know how much that role weighs in the public sphere, but of course we have roles as, as historians and as members of a historical associate, um, members of the uh, Society for French Historical Studies. Um, um, uh, by activism, so many things can be understood. Um, I think that the posting, for example, of the AHA declaration is fine and good, but it's going to have a very limited impact. Uh, who's going to read that except all of us? Um, and I think the activism, if it's going to count for anything at all, um, uh, needs to be done um, not just collectively by the issuing of these of these statements or by the reiteration of these statements, but needs to be done also um, um, as individual historians, and not just as historians, but as teachers. Um, um, you don't need me to hear this, but uh, we really have um, a remarkable charge um, being in a classroom um, uh, with 20, 30, 200 students, um, um, uh, three hours a week. And um, it's our task, I suspect, to, um, or I know, and of course you can differ with me, but it's our task to let them know about the past. Um, they need it more than ever. Um, and if we don't respond to this call, I don't, I don't want to leave it to the late night comics. Um, they're great, um, but they're just the beginning. Um, they're not the end. Uh, just as ancient Greece needed its Aristophanes, um, they also needed their Thucydides and their Herodotus, not to mention their tragic poets. Um, and so I do think it's a civic obligation that uh, falls on all of our shoulders. And I hope that doesn't sound like boilerplate. Um, I do mean that sincerely. Yeah, but you know, I think uh, in a post-truth world, just talking about tr the truth, which is as cliche as you can get, actually has deep, powerful resonance. So I, um, so we've we've gone from kind of a discussion about an existential and moral imperative for scholars, and talked about myriad ways in which actually on the ground uh, we can act in the public sphere through writing trade press books, through journalism, through op-eds, through public programming.
uh, through radio and podcasts. I just want to do a quick shout out for Roxanne uh, Panchassi's uh, show, which is just an awesome venue for uh, us to stay apprised of what's going on in French studies, but yet another model. I have a, a colleague who is going to spend part of her tenure, um, uh, her um, sabbatical time, thinking about a podcast. A podca podcasts are yet another mechanism of kind of entrepreneurial opportunity for people to uh, begin to address broader publics, uh, blogs, social media, and, and even through organizational activism, which we haven't said that much about. Um, so with all of that out there and maybe 10 or 15 minutes left over the course of lunch, let's just kind of open it up and maybe instead of only taking uh, you know, one question and then an answer, let's just try and hear from as many of you as possible and then maybe with the last couple minutes we'll, we'll put things uh, into some order. that in and of itself um, assumes that we're talking about how does the past inform the present? Or is there a, a role for historians where we don't have to relate it to current events, say? Because there the connection is obvious, but what about the people who study medieval queenship, you know, or whatever it is that they study? Uh, you, first of all, thank you both. Uh, you, you've urged us to be 
these questions are incredibly complicated and you have hopefully we'll have at least stoked a set of issues and concerns and considerations that will have been fruitful over lunch. I, I don't know where to start, except that I, I know that Sarah was going to ask me about my children, and, and, but you don't have the time to ask about them. Oh, okay. Um, the, the grad student questions, um, I find the most pressing, and, um, and I take these, um, they really go to the bone, um, um, in part because I work um, um, in the Honors College at U of H, and um, perhaps more so than most of the other departments at the university, our teaching is done by adjuncts, those newly minted PhDs um, who are scrambling in order to put, to put together enough courses either at U of H alone or U of H and the community college system so that they can you know, keep a roof over their heads. Um, and when I've approached the adjuncts and honors to write these articles, um, rather than thinking about, for example, the consequences it's going to have between, say, opposing dissertation, a dissertation advisor and somebody equally powerful in the field who has um, also you know, um, public reach. Um, they're thinking about much more practical issues. For example, I am teaching four courses a semester, five courses a semester. I'd love to do it, but I can't. Okay? And so um, once you actually hit the market, you're going to be, at least for a few years, facing that very same situation. And so my response is, well, we have to do something about making life more livable for our adjuncts. Um, and then you can worry about the politics. Um, they need to be paid a fair wage. They need to be given a, a, at least a modicum of security and health coverage, um, things that we are not doing. Um, and um, you know, there are things you can do as individuals. I gave up my office at Honors because the crunch is so great, it's now used by adjuncts. Um, and I also found that students never come to office hours anymore. They, they text you. Right? And so I, and I don't work in an office. I work in my kitchen. So I didn't need the office. They needed the office because they see the students. I don't. Um, so yeah, there, there are really practical considerations. And then I think the ones that you just spoke about come after. And I think my two minutes are more than up. Yeah. They are. Um, I just want to second what you said very quickly, which is, a, where we began, the corporatization of the university. And I want to echo what was said in the back about um, professional organizations being one kind of place in which we can redress some of these things, but also the question that you brought up about administration and professors in the administration. Um, enlightened administrators are, we need more of these people. This, is, this gives you access to the levers of power and to the budgets that um, make policy, and these are all places in which we can directly affect a difference. And um, the, the other thing I want to say is there is the risk of, of trolling and hate mail. Um, I know about it because I have experienced this, having been, you know, I, I wound up on Jihad Watch. There's a story there that, that I wrote about in Inside Higher Education. And there is that risk as well. But um, this is the world that we are in. And if we are going to make a difference in a post-fact context, we've got to be willing to take these risks. And they operate on, on multiple levels. And then. The last thing that I would say is the thing about public libraries. I really like that comment um, as well in general. Retirement communities. In general, we need to be thinking about building connections to broader publics. There are many of them out there. People are thirsty for what it is that we have to offer. We just have to give it to them in a language that Max Zaretsky understands. And we can do this. We are equipped to do it. 
there's a moral imperative, an existential imperative that we do it. Um, so let's go do that work that needs to be done. Thank you.